You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. But in life, we grow from our failures. You don't really grow tremendously from your successes. They feel really good and they're really fun. And there's some data points you take away, but that's not how you grow as a human being. You grow as a human being when things go awry, when there's a challenge. <laughs> Welcome to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. And we're two fi- t- two, fi- <laughs> two perfect strangers who met by chance and embraced the opportunity. Listen in as we chat with other successful people about the risks they've taken to put themselves on a path to creative success. We are so excited to be here. Alan, can you introduce our guest today? Oh my goodness, Jenny Steingart is somebody I've known for a little bit now. She's a Tony Award winner who worked her way up as an entry-level intern to now being a producing powerhouse. She's worked alongside some of the greatest names in the industry, including, you know, Tina Fey, Joel Grey, Patrick Stewart, Josh Groman. Groman. Did you just call him Josh Groman? Groman. Okay, more coffee. You should tell Josh that Alan doesn't know how to say his name, Jenny. Josh Grobin and Lynn manuel Miranda, just to name <laughs> drop a few. And of course, she co-founded Ars Nova and a Japanese animation studio called Ultra Super Pictures, and is also one of the masterminds behind bringing freestyle love supreme, supreme, supreme to Broadway. Jenny Steingart, how are you doing this morning? I am doing well. Thank you so much. I, I liked I liked your little preem 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 preem. That was. Uh... <laughs> You can't say Freestyle Love Supreme without saying bring, 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 because, of course, that's what they do in the show. No, you kind of can't. And I want to congratulate you, because <laughs> between the last time you and I had an official chat, and now you won your special Tony Award for Freestyle Love Supreme. Thank you very much. It was thrilling, thrilling, and... Um, it was so many years in the making. It's like, you know, an overnight success that took 18 years. So it, <laughs> that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's always the way these things look from the outside. It's only from the inside that you realize just how long and, you know, arduous a, a road it can be, but it was, it made it all the sweeter. So it was, it was wonderful. Mm, congratulations. The weekend that we launched this show was the weekend after Thanksgiving and Alan and I went to see Freestyle Love Supreme that weekend. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, God, I love the show. I've seen it so many times and I love that it's out on tour now, uh, just like any Broadway show. And we're going to get into this in a second. But uh, what's really cool is that in addition to Freestyle of Supreme, the show, there's FLS Academy, which we're going to get into later. But FLS as a core, a lot of the core cast from Broadway is also touring now all over the country, which is just phenomenal. But for me, I, I mean, there's so many things we're going to touch on, but like this is an improv show that's on Broadway and it's an improv show that won a Tony Award. And, you know, the fact that like everybody loves to name drop Lynn and it's like before there was in the Heights and before there was Hamilton. I just want to name drop Jenny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Jenny, what you said a second ago is that there are so many people that you know, think it's an overnight success. But as you said, it was 18 years in the making and overnight successes don't even happen in a vacuum anyway. And Lynn has, Lynn has his name put out there because he's obviously very popular for many reasons, but he stands on the shoulders of you and so many other people who took a chance on giving him an opportunity, giving giving others this opportunity, embracing, uh, you know, the, the, the overall unknown of the fact that, like, this isn't a traditional show. So why, after... After 18 years, why did you keep going with this? Well, and it, it, speaking of freestyle specifically, I mean, if you've seen the show, it's not hard to yes. understand why yes. you've, you know, you become addicted. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, obviously everyone, um, everyone grows as an artist as as they go along. So the whole group, you know, has only upped their game over the years. But that said it's still pretty much the same show that it was all those years ago. And in the beginning, you know, we were doing everything we could to just get audiences. And, it, you know, very, very early on, it was like, you know, I can't believe people haven't caught on to this yet. <laughs> um, and so, but we just believed in it so much. I mean, it, it was pretty hard to deny the astounding talent on the stage. And, you know, what's so wonderful about the show also is we really are a show that 
um, and this has happened before, if, you know, if suddenly power goes out, mics go off, lights are out, and, you know, they have to stand around on the street, they can do a show. Yeah. Like, it doesn't require anything other than, you know, these incredible human beings showing up and using their imaginations and their talents. So it was just infectious and and the talent was undeniable. And at the time, everyone involved, um, Lynn and Tommy Kale and Anthony Viniziali and uh, Chris Sullivan, who's Shockwave, our beatboxer, you know, all of these guys, and there are many more that I'm not even mentioning, but all of the the guys from, from early on, you know, they were really just out of college. And <laughs> at the time, Lynn was a substitute teacher. Um, <laughs> and he had his students were groupies, and they would come and after the show, they would wait, and they'd be like, Mr. Miranda, Mr. Miranda. Um, it was really, it was adorable and um, sweet. And really also it, it felt like a family, like we were really creating something um, together, mm. all of us. And we were um, certainly had some experience, but it was early days for Ars Nova and we were um, establishing a way of working and freestyle was really one of the first shows at the theater that um, for for both sides of it, you know, it was an opportunity for all of us to kind of figure it out together. And it's certainly, you know, one of the things that was has been exciting about Ars Nova, but where I'm always really careful in walking the line is, uh, you know, I think we um, have had a great eye for finding talent or recognizing talent. But, you know, these are people that are forces of nature unto themselves and, you know, would have gone on without us to do wonderful things as well. It's, it's just that I like to say, um, I think, <laughs> I think of myself as a midwife. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that. You no, know, it's like, how do we help birth this baby? And, you know, it was really trying to set everybody up for success. I mean, they had certainly performed shows before, but I believe Ars Nova was the first time that there was like a consistent, we're showing up, I don't remember how many shows a week we did it in the early days, four shows a week, five shows a week, but consistently showing up and then having notes after the show. And, you know, it was not just one-offs, which had been, you know, certainly a way they, they had worked um, before us. It's just become a labor of love. And then, you know, Ars Nova, the not-for-profit Ars Nova, uh, because they're now, all of these years later, almost two decades later, we work differently. I work as a commercial uh, producer as well, and that's Ars Nova Entertainment, which is a you know for-profit commercial company, which is not affiliated officially with Ars Nova Theater, which is the not-for-profit. Um, but you know, all of these years later, it's um, it's just exciting to see all of the things that have come from that space and uh, and people like the freestyle gang uh, going out into the world and, you know, really being able to, what I think is bringing at this particular moment in time, much needed mm. joy and catharsis yeah. really, because, because the show is different every single night, you can really speak to the moment in the moment from the moment in ways that that really does feel very cathartic. There isn't, yeah. you know, any other way to say it. Everyone tells me, you know, they will. And I mean, I have this experience no matter how many hundreds of times I've seen <laughs> that. Before. You know, I laugh, of course, every single time. And usually I cry, you know, if when they do true. Mm, it's true. Yeah, true. Yes. Yeah. I, I really challenge somebody not to, not to lose it a little bit during true because those, that, that group is just, they are so honest and vulnerable. And, um, and it really is the most beautiful example of art and theater. You know, when they talk about is, is theater a window or a mirror? And yes, I, right? <laughs> yes, and, it's, both. And, and, and it's both. It's both. And freestyle is, a, I just think a beautiful example of, of that writ large. Yeah. Jenny, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Ars Nova, the nonprofit from what I know, that exists because of chance. Can you share with our audience how Ars Nova came to be? The origin story is one that is um, bittersweet 
and it's a chance, but it actually has informed really the way I move in the world and my philosophy of the world and actually how I kind of lean into everything that I do. So my brother, Gabe, um, who was my younger brother, in 1997, he died very unexpectedly of a brain aneurysm. And he had just, he was a sound engineer, um, a music producer. He had a record label, a classical record label that specialized in early music. And he was a musicologist. He was really, really exceptional human being. And he had just purchased the property that Ars Nova, the 54th Street space, sits on. And the plan had been to make it a mastering studio. And he was just beginning construction. He had found, um, it was like this tiny little building in that spot that the, I think it was like an accounting office and they had, it was, they filed for bankruptcy. So he had gotten this building for a song. And as you all probably know, and particularly in the late nineties, um, that area where in Hell's Kitchen, that particular area was the hub and of of recording. Um, Hit Factory was across the street. Sony was across the street. So he was like right in the in the heart of it. And when he passed away, it was such. Besides the grief of it, it was you know I was still in my twenties myself, and the existential shock of losing a young person like yeah. that so suddenly horrible. Right? It was, it was horrible. And also, you know, so I was not just dealing with grief, but I was having a total existential crisis. Um, This is, you know, as I look back, like, of course I was, I didn't know how I was going to preserve his legacy. It felt very important to me. I felt like he had not gotten to do what he was meant to do and how was I going to keep it going? And I was just launching a career as a producer, as a young producer and, you know, knew nothing about early music, nor was it my passion. And the story I tell, um, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but uh, the story I have told multiple times about the space was what changed everything for me because I kept thinking, wow, I really need to do something and it has to be in the music space. But the week that he passed away, we sat Shiva. And at the end of the week, there had been so many people that had come through my parents' house that we um, we had catered the Shiva. And so at the end of the week, the head waiter came to me in the living room. It was the last day of Shiva. And he said, do you mind? One of the servers has asked if she could speak to you in the kitchen. So I didn't know what that was going to be. And I went into the kitchen and there was a girl there and she said, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is so-and-so, and and I'm so sorry for your loss. I've been here all week, and I've listened to people talk about Gabe, and I just wanted to tell you, I'm the same age as your brother was. I'm 26, and this is my get-by job, but my real passion, my, my work is I'm a fine artist. I'm a painter, and I have been really inspired here listening to people talk about Gabe. And every night I've gone home after I've worked here and I've stayed up all night and I've painted. Wow. And oh, I, I have chills. I have painted a whole new series of work and I wonder if I could share it with you. And so she walked over and she had this huge portfolio that she had brought with her to Shiva And she opened it up on the table in the kitchen and she showed me all these beautiful paintings that she had created. And the penny just dropped for me in that moment. I thought, you know, she didn't know my brother and his life and now his death had inspired art. It had inspired art in a completely different medium. And that's when I realized I didn't need to continue Gabe's specific vision. Mm. I didn't need to produce yeah. early music. I could find a way to give a voice to the things that I was passionate about and then to other people who, you know, Gabe didn't. We, we were very fortunate that we had the opportunities in, as siblings and in my family, we had the opportunities to go on and pursue our dreams. Gabe's was cut short. Um, but I thought this is a real chance to give other artists an opportunity to fulfill their dreams. And for me, it was also a way to kind of have what has continued to feel like 
a living relationship with my brother, as odd as that sounds. But, you know, his name, it's on every, it's on everything we do, every program, every piece of, you know, mailer that goes out, it says Ars Nova was built in the memory of Gabe Wiener. And, um, and it's, so it's very special for me, but it really has informed um, my life view. You know, I do believe that Art, art is essential. Yes. And I do believe that grief and crisis and trauma and hard times and all of those things that every human being goes through, and God knows we've all gone through it in the last two years, if nothing else, that art and artists help us metabolize that grief. And there's always beauty on the other side of it. And so uh, that's that's what I'm really interested in. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested in how do we transmute pain and challenge into beauty. And so even in the most challenging, difficult times of my life, I really hold on to the Ars Nova origin story. And I know, you know, 20 years later, I look back and I look, I would give anything in the world to have my brother. Back. Yeah. But, but in the absence of that opportunity, I can say that what a gift that has come out of such a loss, what beauty has come out of such a loss and what opportunity has come out of such a loss. So, you know, I really work hard in my everyday life to when, when things are very challenging to say, where are the gifts that can come from this? How do I grow? Mm -hmm. How do I make meaning from it? So, that that's the the story of Ars Nova, and I think it's one of the reasons that we have managed, you know, almost two decades in to really kind of stay mission aligned um, and and keep our purpose there because it's such a strong origin story. Yeah, it's beautiful. I have chills up and down, and I'm I'm curious, Jenny, because um, that is such a it's such a beautiful story, but there's a lot of chance that played into that. Of course, the tragic loss of your brother and then meeting this woman and, and finding your own inspiration, your way to honor, but do it on your own terms. How, if at all, has has embracing chance in that way informed you as people unknowns like Lynn manuel Miranda or, you know, across the board, there are a lot, he's not the only one. There are lots of unknown people that you have backed and supported that have become hugely successful. How has embracing chance like that helped you discover and support these talents? It's it's interesting because I, I think where things have, um, for me, and I, I believe it probably is this way for everyone, you know, the times in our life where you feel doors opening for you, and sometimes it doesn't even just feel like doors are opening. Sometimes if you're lucky, it feels like doors are being thrown off hinges. You yes. Know? <laughs> you're, you're, you're blowing off the hinges. That for me, that happens if I am, I call it like being in flow. Um, if I'm in flow, and that usually means that I am really deeply connected and aligned with a sense of like an authentic passion or sense of purpose in some way. And so I just really work hard on trusting my gut instinct. And if I feel a connection to an artist or material, or I say, you know, I see someone and I just think, oh my God, what a voice that person has, what a point of view that person has. It's really about trusting our instincts and feeling comfortable, you know, passing on things that don't feel aligned with our, our, our own authenticity. Because there have been, you know, I mean, certainly at this moment in my life and in my career, I have some wonderful opportunities that come my way. And sometimes there are opportunities that come my way that I know are going to be successful. Like I know they'll you know, if it's theater, I'll think like, oh, that may win a Tony this year. That's really good. Or that might win a festival if it's a film or all of those things. But if I don't feel deeply connected to the material or I am not involved in this development in some way, I'm not really looking to just rack up awards or 
Like it, that just doesn't interest me. And don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't love. No, award, I love that else. though. Yeah. That's not what, it's, you know, I'm a human being, but that's not what drives me. Like I am much more interested in feeling passionate about a project and the rest is a byproduct. You know, that's just icing on the cake. But um, there have been plenty of things that I've been involved with, you know, certain things over the, like, even if I think about over the years at Ars Nova um, in the not-for-profit space, you know, the, I, now I was going to say the hundreds of things, but the thousands of things we've produced. And some, some have been um, extremely well-received, some not as well-received, but I can tell you that, you know, and I'll never say what they are, but there have been shows that have been poorly received, but that I am so deeply proud of that, although it was disappointing not to be better received, I could live with it because it was something that I really felt was special. And on the flip side, there have been shows that have been, you know, really review reviews and wonderful reviews and, and um, that I, I thought like, eh, like, you know, okay, it's good, <laughs> but maybe it just didn't touch me in quite the same way. At the end of the day, for me, I'm more interested in really being connected to that work. So, you know, I, I really do think that being um, tied into what is your passion is the way that it helps us recognize those things that mean something to us. So where where then does shows like Mean Girls and Great Comet that are also Tony nominated where did that come in? Because those are obviously the big commercial successes. And, but it sounds like your passion is for things that just make you feel good. Yes. Well, so a combination of things. Um, so, well, Great Comet, you know, originated at Ars Nova. Um, we developed it. I was passionate about the project when it was at the theater and um, was very, very happy and thrilled to step into the commercial space with it, um, not as the lead producer, but uh, as a co-producer on it. And um, it felt a little bit like, I mean, it was really, it was a big deal for us as a theater. And um, it felt a little bit like I wanted to kind of be a, a, a around for that. I wanted to, uh, as we moved forward into that space as an organization and so deeply believed in the creative team of that. So that felt like kind of a no brainer that we were going to do that. You know, we are more driven, uh, like emerging artists and new artists, but amazingly, um, the first show we ever produced at Ars Nova was a show called Melancholy Baby, which was written by Michael Thomas and Jeff Richmond, who is married to Tina Fey and who's brilliant in his own right. And we have been friends with those guys for almost 20 years. And um, Melancholy Baby remains one of my all-time favorite things that I have ever produced. It, it, is, it is hilarious and brilliant and such good memories of launching the theater with that show. And so when Jeff and Tina were doing Mean Girls, they reached out to John, my husband and co-founder of Ars Nova as well, reached out to us and asked if we wanted to be a part of Mean Girls. And again, that was sort of a no brainer. It was where, as I was saying, it is about being aligned. You know, I felt Tina as a voice um, and having known her that long as well and seen her rise to see who she has become and where her talent has taken her um, has been thrilling to watch. Uh, they're wonderful people, um, both, I mean, obviously professionally, but personally, they're just wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And it also felt like a no brainer. And it felt kind of like a return home coming full circle that the first show that we had all done together in New York, and then suddenly it was the first Broadway show. And to have gone from this tiny little theater where everyone was up, you know, three in the morning, they drove a U-Haul from Chicago with sets and, you know, the open, the Jack McBrayer came out with a giant tire and a set right when we were <laughs> opening the theater to go from that to being on Broadway with, you know, a lot of the same folks was really thrilling. So that was, that was the natural extension of that. It was the the personal relationship that had started so long ago from a professional relationship. I love your commitment to being passionate about the work. Have there ever been projects 
that you have passed on because you, they don't need you to be successful? Like, is there something like, I want to really help these emerging artists that I, I think I can help in a unique way. But sometimes someone will come across your desk and you're like, they're going to do fine. They don't need me. Uh, yeah, that happens every day, all the time. And again, you know, I'll, I mean, truthfully, yes, like they don't need me. But I also feel like if I can't show up to the space in a way where I feel like I am truly moving the ball down the field and there's a lane for me, then it's just not a good match yeah. because, you know, this is about mutually, like how do we all do it together? And and um, I'm just not interested in writing a check or raising money and not having some kind of involvement in the creative vision, in the, you know, all this stuff like that for me, the, the development for me is the fun part. Yeah. Like that, you know, every producer is different. Everybody has different strengths. Um, there are areas that I know, <laughs> there are areas I know not my strongest, strongest lane. Um, and other areas where I'm like, yeah, this is my space. This is my, mm. this is my wheelhouse. So I want a, a place where I can do that also, where I really feel like I'm contributing in some way. And so if it's really just about writing a check or the, the piece is done, I mean, I'll, look, and I'll never say never. There sure. are always specific situations where there might be a reason that you do something that is kind of out of your norm. But that being said, absolutely, I would say most of the time I pass on things that are not self-generated. Like I'm usually more interested in projects that are very early stage, oftentimes things that someone either close to me or a group of us get together and ideate and think, wouldn't it be cool to do so-and-so or such and such, or let's talk to this person or what are they up to? Or sometimes there's just someone I really want to work with. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I've, I've more and more have been going to folks that I just am big fans of and saying, uh, whatever you want to do, the answer is yes. You know, and then figuring, out, figuring out what that looks like. When you are uh, growing these things from scratch, you said there's a lot of things that, you know, the big commercial things, you don't, you don't want to just write a check and you don't want to just get an award and, and you want to have a personal investment in it, which I feel is, is very, very admirable and super, super cool. I assume along with all of that way of thinking and that mindset in business, you have to deal with a lot of, I won't call them failures, but things that are not successful. So how do you prioritize what's what do you think is going to work what's not going to work and then when things don't become successful how do you embrace that and turn it into something positive well first of all you know in life not just in theater but in life we grow from our failures absolutely you, know, you, don't, you don't really grow tremendously from your successes they feel really good and they're really fun and there's some data points you take away but that's not how you grow as a human being you grow as a human being when things go awry, when there's a challenge. And I don't give a lot of thought to the failure piece of it. I mean, you know, again, and I'm not a big sports person, but I do know, you know, that a 300 batting average means that you're failing seven times out of 10. <laughs> so, you know, the, the idea that everything, you're going to hit it out of the park every time, it's just a, it's, it's just a silly expectation, you know? I mean, I think that that's part of the problem. We, we live in this world where we think like our kids are supposed to get straight A's and be great in every subject and everything we do has to be a success. That just isn't how life works. No. And, and truthfully, you know, as we also, if you think back on your life and all of the things that have gotten you to where you are in this moment, the only reason we are all sitting here in this moment is because the confluence event of events and things that have happened to us leading up to this moment, which means huge successes and huge failures, that is what has gotten us here. So I really do trust, even if it feels so shitty in the moment, I really trust that that is just the path that I am on at that moment. That is the way things worked out. So that is the chance. That is, 
I just, I don't really know how else to show up in the world. I just, you know, my dad used to say when I would say, I'm so, you know, what if I make a mistake? What if I make a mistake? And my, <laughs> my dad said, honey, that's why they put erasers on pencils. I mm. love that. And it's so simple, but yes, that is right. And we're so afraid of making a move because we might fuck it up. Like, you know, so what? You're supposed to mess it up. That's the process. <laughs> how you many have to? How many amazing inventions came out of of mess ups too? Like the I, chocolate chip cookie. The chocolate is chip one cookie. Of them. The sticky note, right? They wanted to make <laughs> yeah. they wanted to make really strong glue, and they got like sort of strong glue, and they're like, oh, let's call it a sticky note, and look at sticky notes. How right. How about you, Jenny? What about Have there been any of the thousands of things that you've produced that were better? because of a massive failure or mistake? Uh, you know, I, I can't give you a, I mean, uh, there are probably a million of those. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, nothing really you know, catchy jumps out at me. But I, I do think, you know, like, I know that artists do best when there are limitations and constraints. You know, if you say, you've got a million dollars to do this, um, it is not going to be as creative a, a piece of work as if you say to a set designer, you've got a stick of chewing gum and a Q-tip. <laughs> Go! Be my guy. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a there's an amazing quote. I'm a, I'm a big lover of um, the Stoics. Uh, sounds so ridiculous, but I was a philosophy major and that is how I, that's how I nerd out. But there's this amazing Marcus Aurelius quote that I love, and I actually keep it in front of me all the time. And it says, a blazing fire makes flames and brightness out of everything that is thrown into it. It really means that our failures as well, every obstacle, everything, you throw it into the fire and the fire burns brighter. So to me, all of that, the successes and the failures of it, you know, those are those are the powerful things. Those are the things that's the fuel. So, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sound like some automaton who doesn't experience disappointment and sure. depression. And I mean, I get just as depressed as the next person if something doesn't go well, but I allow myself time to wallow in that. And then I say, nope, you know, throw that into the fire. That's information I now have. And how do I move forward and make something from that? You know, I love that. coming back full circle, that's a very freestyle love, supreme, preem, preemie sort of way <laughs> of thinking about life. Because I, one of the things that I love about the crew in general is that before you go out on stage, everybody, you know, they huddle up. They're like, I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. Like there is no mistake yep. on stage because everything you do do that is not what you plan on doing is either going to turn into something just as good or will be picked up and covered and improved upon by the people standing next to you. That's absolutely right. And, you know, the the thing is, first of all, you, you know, one of the tenets of improv, one of the tenets of improv is yes and. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't yeah. yes, it's not yes but, which is the way most of life, unfortunately, seems to go, where people are constantly yes butting you. It's yes and. So, you have a great idea and then you throw to someone else and they come up with what on the surface seems like a really shitty idea, but sometimes that's where the gold happens. That is where you have to embrace the gold and you embrace the unknown of it and what may seem, you know, because the thing is events, events that happen to us, um, we have a tendency as human beings, I think, to assign value to an event as a good event or a bad event, right? Like it's a good yes. event. Mm -hmm. But the, tr the truth is it's really just a data point and how you interpret it is whether it's good or bad. So, you know, an idea, if someone on stage throws something out, it's not a good word or a bad word. That's just the word. And what you do with that word is whether it worked or it didn't work. So, you know, I think everything is really like that opportunity to how do you frame this? And and so, yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting, Alan, I hadn't really thought about it until you said that, the comparison to freestyle, but it probably speaks to something on a deep level that I wasn't even thinking about or aware of as to one of the reasons that I am so attracted to that show mm. is 
kind of the endless possibility that comes from what looks like, oh my God, they're going to die on stage. What are they going to do? <laughs> what are they going to do? I mean, I am not kidding. There was a, uh, one of the games which we were just mentioning earlier called True, where the audience throws out words, they pick a word, and then they sing and rap about it. Uh, and it has to be based on something true that really happened to them. And there was one night <laughs> where they, the word was tampon. Um, <laughs> I remember it's all dudes up there most of the time, right? So It, it was in those days. Um, <laughs> now, not so much, but in those days it was. And I remember thinking when I first heard that word, I put a value judgment on it and I was like, oh shit, why did they pick that word? Because I wanted something <laughs> that was going to resonate and be moving. And, you know, I really wanted to go to that place with that particular segment of the show. And if I tell you that I was in tears because the way whoever it was on stage that night, um, oh, I actually remember one of the person who always has me in tears, Chris Jackson. Yes. Oh, Not, I love Chris Jackson. You cannot see that boy do a true without having a box of tissues with you. It is <laughs> just, he is so from the heart. It's just so beautiful. But even a word like that, it the story that was surrounding it was so beautiful, as odd as that sounds, it was so beautiful and vulnerable that it ended up being something incredible. And so anyway, I, I think that, you know, that's really about kind of just keeping an, an open mind and the, the possibilities instead of shutting it down. Mm, I love that. What is your relationship? I don't like to use the word quit or quitting because it has such a negative connotation. And I, I quite frankly think there's a big difference in just going, fuck it, I can't do it, throw it in the towel and assessing the information that's presented to you and saying, this is this doesn't serve me. This doesn't work. We're going to let this go. We're going to open up space for something else. How do you feel about quote unquote quitting or changing your mind? There's a big difference between quitting because you don't want to push through a difficult moment yeah. and really being able to honestly assess or reassess if something is in the right place, if something should be happening, whether you are still deeply connected to the work itself. I think pivoting, I like to think of it as pivoting. Yes. I mean, that's, um, that's the word, the pandemic word, isn't it? <laughs> we all pivoted. The <laughs> pandemic pivot. The pandemic pivot. And I, I think it's essential. I mean, I think it's essential, but but you have to really make sure that you have a really honest relationship with yourself. I mean, if you're just spinning yourself that and you're coming up with all the reasons why it's not good for you to move forward with it, if you're quitting out of fear, that's a different that's different to me. That looks different. But I am completely comfortable with saying this is no longer serving me or I can't serve this piece the way it deserves to be served anymore. We are growing and evolving as human beings all the time and our projects grow and evolve. And sometimes you grow apart from one um, or it's growing into something that you no longer are the best person to oversee it. You know, there are so many factors that go into it, but I, I I don't inherently think like you have to muscle through something just because you started it. I mean, you have to make sure it's in good hands and you're not abandoning people and all of those things. But I always want to look really honestly at things and make sure that I am excited, uh, excited by them. And if I find myself, uh, there was a project a few years back that I had been working on for several years. And I every single time we had to have uh, meetings about it, there was this little piece of me that was dreading the conversations. And I had to really look at what that was about. And it was about several different things for me in particular. And I ended up withdrawing from the project. Um, wow. And it's a project that will be successful. It just, for various reasons, was not the right fit for me anymore. You know, everybody is still friends and it was, it was just an honest conversation. This isn't a good fit. And I, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with that as long as, you know, you've done the work going in to really evaluate why you're walking away. Evaluate why you're walking away. That's really the key. Why? 
and being really honest with yourself about it. Uh, and it, and so often it's just better for everyone. And also there's this element of if, if you're miserable, if it's not bringing you any joy, how can you produce something quality if it's making you really miserable? Well, you can't. And on top of that, you know, as I said earlier, no one, no one likes things not to be well received, but if I'm passionate about something, if it, doesn't get great reviews or the audiences don't respond. I'm disappointed, but I can sleep at night because I felt really proud of it. The worst feeling in the entire world is a project that deep down you didn't believe in, but you yeah. stuck with and it's not well received. You want to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst feeling because you think, why didn't I trust my gut instinct? Why did I do this? And this, this is a very challenging industry in terms of how long it takes to get movement on something. I mean, we're talking years and years yeah. of working on something. It doesn't mean every day needs to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns. It's not going to be every day, but you have to be in pursuit of something you love and are passionate about. Other than that final payoff. Like this, I mean, it's a cliche for a reason, but life is the journey. There is yeah. no there, there, you know, yes. there, there just isn't. I mean, we all think, you know, if I lose five pounds, I'll be happy. If I, <laughs> if this happens, I'll be happy. You know, tomorrow isn't promised. We better be fulfilled and happy as much as possible today. So I want to enjoy that process. Yeah, it sounds like you've done a lot of introspective work, which uh, I think people maybe go their whole lives without actually doing. And it's true. <laughs> and there's a favorite. There's a saying of mine that I that I love is wherever you go, there you are. So I if love you're that saying too. Yep. if you're running away from something, or you think if I just get over there, it's it's the same. You know, it's a take on the grass is always greener on the other side. So once you get there, don't forget to look back on where you came from and realize why you made the travel, what you were trying to get to or get from or whatever the case is. Because yeah, you're absolutely right that if wherever you get where you are, if you haven't dealt with what you were quote unquote running away from, you're still going to be running away from that thing. A hundred percent. I mean, that's why. When people talk about money not buying happiness, the, the reason that that's true is because, you know, if you're just chasing something all the time, that is not going to serve you. That just isn't. You know, no. we really only have the present moment. And I want to go to sleep at night knowing that I have done something for myself in that day, whether it's personal or professional or a moment with my kids or whatever that looks like, but that there's a moment in the day where I felt present and that I felt that I contributed to the world in some way. And it doesn't mean I'm not even, again, I'm not saying I'm successful at that every day. I struggle with that just like everyone else does, but that's at least my intention in a, in a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say that, it, it makes me think of a very elusive word. That's a very popular word. Uh, called balance, which, you know, I, <laughs> oh, just that. I'm actually a fan of that word, but I have reframed it for me, which is it's, it's not like, it's not about equality. It's not like the scales of justice to me, feeling <laughs> balance. Sounds like, sounds like a movie scales of justice, <laughs> the scales of justice for me, balance is more about when you check in with yourself, like you just mentioned, how do you feel at the end of the day, the week, the month, the year, do you feel good? about how you're spending your time, who you're spending your time with, what's coming out of that. And that, you know, what's, what is, how do you feel about balance? Does that resonate with you? I mean, it is a tightrope for sure. And yeah. I am, um, <laughs> I have a boundary issue. So it's, I, I, tend to say, <laughs> I tend to say yes more often than I should. And then mm. I get into it. I'm like, oh my God, what was I thinking? But it's because there are so many things I want to do. And I'm, and uh, so the balance piece is a challenge for me, um, like like I know for so many folks, but I think where I've gotten better at it is recognizing that, you know, when people say you can you can do everything, you can have everything, here's what I think about that. I think you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. That's right. Ooh. Right? That's right. <laughs> so... You have to make choices. 
And I can't be the most successful producer in the world and also be present for my kids when they come home from school or be at the piano recital or be at the school play or the science fair. I, I can't do that. And that's okay. I just need to get comfortable with that. And I feel like the minute we embrace the imperfection of that, it gets easier. I mean, I think about this a lot and I don't, <laughs> maybe it's a non sequitur, but you know, I think like if you were to ask any parent, what is it that you want for your child, your greatest wish? We all say the same thing. We all say, I just want my kids to be happy. Mm. But the reality is that's such a strange goal because life doesn't really work that way. Happiness is a byproduct of something, but I don't really think happiness- Just like money. Just well, like money. Correct. That is yeah. not- If we make happiness the goal, if we make money the goal, then we are always setting ourselves up to be disappointed. And, you know, those, those are byproducts of being fulfilled and aligned with our sense of purpose in the world, why we want to get out of bed, why we want to do something. When we are doing that, that's when we experience happiness. At least that's my experience of it is I experience happiness when I am aligned with a sense of purpose, whether that's a purpose as a producer or as a creator or as a mother or as a wife or as a friend, when we help someone else, you know, those are the reasons, that's when we feel joy and happiness is when we're aligned with our purpose. You know, that makes me think of, I am, it's, this won't surprise any of you, I'm a total theater nerd. It's something that I have always loved. And it was because my mom always took me to the theater, but my mom doesn't like the theater. And just recently I asked her why, and concerts, and like, I love anything live, live entertainment. I said, mom, why did you take me to do all of these things when I was a kid, when you don't like it? And she said, because I've never had a passion and I wanted you to have a passion. Oh, Oh, that's a good mama. It is. She is a good mama. And I just, um, yeah, I, passion is so much. I mean, we just keep coming back to that. I, I love it. Yeah. And I love this notion that as, as a parent, as a colleague, as a friend, as a community member, helping people find their passion and lean into that. And also recognizing, like, I remember when my kids were really little and my oldest son, who's now 18, who's a performer and always been and and has had a very, very strong passion and point of view from the time he was little, little guy. And I remember when he was in preschool talking to another mom and she said, you know, oh my God, you know, Leo's so really passionate about, you know, performance and this and that. And, you know, I don't, little Jimmy just isn't, he doesn't have, <laughs> he, he just doesn't have something like that. And, you know, and that's, first of all, at the time we're talking about like four and five year olds, I'm like, you know, they're passionate about second, please. Maybe wait, wait a minute. minute please. Yeah. <laughs> but besides that, I said, well, what is he into? And she's like, oh, you know, just Legos. And I was like, well, that's a passion. What are you talking about? Just Legos. Like there's a lot you learn from playing with Legos. But yeah. also, you know, diagnostically, it tells you a tremendous amount about yeah. your kid, how your kid learns, you know, he's a builder, he's a creator. And I was thinking like, it's really not that people don't have passions. It's sometimes they don't recognize that yes. it's a passion. They don't recognize that there's value to the, and you know, mm. like everything else, The things that we are all good at, each of us has certain inherent gifts that we're born with that come really naturally and easily to us. And because they come so easy to us, we don't recognize them as superpowers. We just think everybody can do that. What's the big deal about that? And the fact is a lot of times what you think is really obvious, no one else sees. So sometimes it's about learning to identify what are those things that are your superpowers that set you apart that make you see things and lean into things in a way that no one else does and can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is all about igniting that passion in other people, in ourselves. But to do that, it does take reflection because you have to recognize what that is in yourself. What are the things that spark you and make you want to jump out of bed and get get to work? I just want to keep listening to you 
just preach, I know. preach so, forever. Like, where, when are you going on the motivation or motivational <laughs> speaker train? Right. <laughs> it's very kind. Yeah. Anytime, I'm right here. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you thank you so me. much, Jenny. This has been this has been a lot of fun. I really wish we could talk longer. You've got so much to say about pretty much everything, uh, and, and I absolutely love everything you're involved with. And now knowing how you approach your projects, everything that that you get behind, everything Ars Nova is behind, I'm going to just see with that slightly different lens of like, this is a passion of a passion. I mean, take a step back, everything that's come to be is, a, is somebody's passion. But, you know, knowing you personally now, I think it's going to help me uh, just add a little bit of color to, to what you're doing now. And I appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys. This was a lot of fun. It was so much fun to meet you, Jenny. I love everything you're up to. And I'm, I'm, I'll be the, in the front row when you go on your motivation, motivational speaking <laughs> tour. So uh, thank you. Thank you for all that all right. you do Heather, to make I'm the world gonna, I'm going to look for you in the okay. front row. Then. I'm going to be all there. Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. What an incredible human being. I mean, I just feel like everything is so heart centered. I was nervous really? going into this because she's a big fucking deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all of our guests are big fucking deals. You say that about that's everybody. That's true. <laughs> that, that's true. We actually do say that, don't we? Before every conversation, one or the other of us is like, this person's a big fucking deal. <laughs> I love us. I love that we get to do this. <laughs> yeah, she she's just incredible. And, and actually, uh, I know her personally, but like th- went through the official publisher channels just to make sure it was kosher to talk about Freestyle of Supreme and all that stuff. And and the publisher wrote back and was like, Jenny would love to talk about you. She loves it. It's all great. You know, so like it's just it's so cool for for uh, I guess us to experience just a little bit of of this of this life of these people. And like, you know, Jenny and her producing partner, Jill Furman, and all of the other creative team, especially behind Freestyle of Supreme, uh, like literally she was just rattling off names. She didn't go into the depth of the people she's working with. And I mentioned a couple yeah. at the beginning, you know, Josh Gronin, uh, and, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, you know, Lynn and Anthony Vincinelli, Vincinelli from freestyle. One of the founders is absolutely incredible. Like James and Royal, I go hard and Utkarsh joined FLS at the same time. Like Utkarsh has become this major, major actor in his own right. Of course, James and Royal, I go hard, won a Tony for originating genie on Broadway. Just this major guy, mm-hmm. like everybody mm-hmm. that is part of this crew are not only family, they're, uh, I, well, I was gonna say they're not only like friends and colleagues, but they're they've become a family because literally, yeah. as Jenny was saying, FLS started just a fill time between rehearsal moments with Lynn and some yeah, friends, like in a basement, back, back in college, right? Like like Tommy yeah. Tommy Kale, the director, was was part of this. Like they've been friends for twenty years almost. It's been insane. When she was talking about embracing passion. And finding passion. And then at the very end of the conversation, uh, some of the things that we are so good at and we are passionate about, we don't think have value. It made me think of my my third daughter. So she's got this viral TikTok account. And all she does is Marvel edits. And it's wildly popular. And I said, oh, you could really do something. There's a career in, you know, editing and doing that. And she's like, no, that's dumb. I just do it for fun. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit back and let her figure out. She does it all from her phone. It's incredible. I have to say so much of this conversation fit right into my coaching platform, which is the Brave Method. So much about setting boundaries and reassessment and reframing and resilience. And if you want to have it all, you have to have boundaries and you have to manage your expectations and you have to be willing to try things and work with other people and delegate and all these amazing things that, that Jenny does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's what makes a successful uh, business person, a successful producer, a successful friend, family member, any of that, because you have to prioritize for your own mental health and set expectations and priorities for the people around you. Because especially if you are leading a group of people, they just expect you to do everything because inherently, sorry, everybody in the world that I'm generalizing, but everybody in the world is it's sort of lazy. And I think that they're the people that are able to to prioritize again and and say, all right, you do this, you do this, you do this. And here are the constraints, because as Jenny said, OK, artistic yes. person, you have a stick of gum and a 